Toward the end of his life, Deng Xiaoping and reformers in the Communist Party of China recognized that something was wrong. The economic approach they were using wasn't working and they needed to change course. And change they did. China has burst onto the scene as a major player among nations since those reforms began. It's hard to find anything that doesn't have the Made in China label. In spite of the bump in the economic road that China hit in the second half of 2015, the last 30 years for China have been nothing less than spectacular. One has to wonder, how did China's leaders do it? President Xi Jinping explains it was by taking a scientific approach. Dr. Robert Kuhn, in his book, How China's Leaders Think, quotes the president as saying, Before we implement new policies broadly, we always test them thoroughly at the grassroots level, gain experience, and subject them to analysis. This approach has worked well for China. In spite of bumps along the way, which every nation goes through, no one can argue with the fact that the Chinese economy has experienced explosive growth in recent decades. But as China has experimented with Western-style economics, Western-style social behavior has been a byproduct. One must seriously ask, does China really want to follow the West in its downward spiral into moral decadence? Should it not be taking a similar approach regarding morality that it has taken with economic change? And what about the rest of the world? Just as China woke up to realize their system wasn't working and set out on a different course, should we not look at the world's moral landscape and see whether the way that we are living is working? Instead of taking a cautious approach to changing morals, our world is rapidly rewriting the rules. Forms of behavior that were once hardly even mentioned in polite society are now common. Living together before marriage seems to be the norm. Adultery is rampant and families are torn apart as a result. Country after country is accepting and celebrating same-sex marriage. And sexual immorality of all kinds has become the storyline of our entertainment. We've even come to the place where there are calls for removing the gender from a newborn's birth certificate, since we are told we can't know what his or her real gender is. Until recently, with a very few exceptions, all we had to do was look. Religion has been the historic arbiter of morality, and the book known as the Bible has been at least a partial guide for most of Western societies for centuries, but no more. Countries stumble over themselves to see which can be first to cast off biblically-based moral restraints. But isn't it time we stop to analyze and judge the results of our grand experiment? Forget the emotions. What are the facts? How should our moral landscape be judged? Whether we want to believe it or not, the verdict is in. And the consequences of continuing the course will be disaster. For your good and well-being, Stay tuned. A warm welcome to all of you from Tomorrow's World and the Living Church of God, the sponsor of this program. The last century saw dramatic changes in moral behavior, especially in what are known as the Western nations, principally North America and Europe. But changes taking place since the turn of the century have been breathtaking. Who could have guessed that we would see such drastic changes in public opinion regarding sexual behavior? A majority of people in America and Europe had a certain consciousness of God at the beginning of the 20th century. Both Christians and Jews looked to some degree to the Bible, and especially the Ten Commandments as a guiding light for behavior. This was still true, but to a lesser degree at the end of the century. The Ten Commandments could still be found on government property, but belief in God especially an authoritarian God, has deteriorated rapidly. 
and along with it, moral standards. Today, the philosophy of secular humanism prevails in courts, educational institutions, and the media. This philosophy expresses the view that humans can be ethical and moral without God. But is this so? In theory, this may sound attractive, but is it working in practice? One huge problem with secular humanism is its lack of authority to determine right from wrong. If there is no higher power that defines appropriate behavior, each man is left to himself to decide, and without a higher authority which has power to reward or punish, people will do what they want to do if they think they can get away with it. Let me repeat again what President Xi Jinping explained in relation to economics and industrial development. Before we implement new policies broadly, we always test them thoroughly at the grassroots level, gain experience, and subject them to analysis. But has any nation taken the same cautious approach with ethics and morality? Has any nation evaluated this experiment with immorality and asked the question, how is it working? The obvious answer is that none has. Instead, we're picking up speed as we go down the same hedonistic road that past civilizations have traveled toward a disastrous end. Can't we open our eyes and see that the verdict is in? Mankind's experiment in self-centered behavior has failed. Sadly, mankind would rather not be confused with facts when it comes to right and wrong. Do you realize that the book known as the Bible long ago foretold what we are seeing today? The second psalm chides the nations of the world for rebelling against their Creator and casting off the restraints of God's law. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The next two verses record God's response to man's foolishness and pride. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yes, there's going to be a price to pay for our folly. The one who made us knows what works best for us. He knows the natural consequences of rejecting His law, and He doesn't mince words when it comes to sexual relationships. After all, He was the one who created us as sexual beings. Notice in Genesis, the first chapter, and verses 27 and 28. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God He created him. Male and female He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. The Bible tells us that God created sex to be enjoyed within marriage. And when it is, it's good and proper, an institution to be honored. But Paul the Apostle contrasts sex within marriage with its use outside those boundaries. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. In spite of these clear instructions, sex between unmarried people is rampant in many nations today, and is considered normal and acceptable behavior. Yet if we refuse to hear God, we can, if we choose to do so, look at the subject as any scientist or judge would do, in evaluating the results of an experiment. Sadly, our experimentation in rejecting God has gone on way too long, and the verdict is in. If we have eyes to see, we must conclude that the God of the Bible knew what He was talking about, that the fruits or results of sexual immorality are detrimental to the individual and to a harmonious society. In today's postmodern world, truth and facts don't seem to matter. We now live at a time when the forces of emotion, personal opinion, self-expression, and the mantra, your truth may not be my truth, prevails in the West. And these attitudes are spreading to traditional cultures such as China 
and India by way of television, magazines, and the internet. But truth is not fluid. Either something is true and can be backed by evidence, or it is not. Let's look at some myths and some facts. Cohabitation, that is two people living together before marriage, something that was once severely frowned upon, has now become the norm in many countries. But is this a good thing? To learn more about today's topic, visit www.pwcanada.org to read or order your free copy of The Ten Commandments. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine. Call 1-866-784-7895. Call today. Clinical psychologist Meg Jay, writing for the Sunday Review in the New York Times, begins her article describing Jennifer, who came to her for therapy due to a failing marriage. As is so common today, Jennifer and her boyfriend moved in together and only later got married. Dr. J asked how it happened that they moved in together. Her response was consistent with studies reporting that most couples say it just happened. We were sleeping over at each other's place all the time, she said. We like to be together, so it was cheaper and more convenient. It was a quick decision, but if it didn't work out, there was a quick exit. Dr. J then explained that researchers actually have a term for this, sliding, not deciding. Moving from dating to sleeping over to sleeping over a lot to cohabitation can be a gradual slope one not marked by rings or ceremonies or sometimes even a conversation. Couples bypass talking about why they want to live together and what it will mean. The article then goes on to explain that cohabiting partners often have different agendas, unspoken and sometimes unconscious agendas, but men and women tend to see things differently. Women are more likely to view cohabitation as a step toward marriage, while men are more likely to see it as a way to test a relationship or postpone commitment. And this gender asymmetry is associated with negative interactions and lower levels of commitment even after the relationship progresses to marriage. One thing men and women do agree on, however, is that their standards for a live-in partner are lower than they are for a spouse. So why do some end up settling for less and getting married? There are, of course, the couples who plan on getting married before moving in together. And while there are pitfalls to this, their marriages statistically work out better than those who only consider marriage after moving in. But part of the problem is that sliding into a live-in relationship is easier than deciding to get out. After all, who gets the TV? Who takes the furniture that was purchased jointly or the car? And how do you divide the dog or cat? In too many cases, it's easier to get married than to go through what amounts to a cohabitational divorce. Sociology professor David Popano of Rutgers University and the co-director of the National Marriage Project also weighs in on this subject. Many studies have found that those who live together before marriage have less satisfying marriages and a considerably higher chance of eventually breaking up. One reason is that people who cohabit may be more skittish of commitment and more likely to call it quits when problems arise. But in addition, the very act of living together may lead to attitudes that make happy marriages more difficult. As pro-cohabitation has become the only politically correct and acceptable response, we should expect that there will be attempts to skew the truth. But for those who have eyes to see, the verdict is in. How many times have you heard it said that marriage is just a piece of paper? But do such smug statements stand up to the facts? Many studies have shown that marriage is good for both men and women. 
Note this report from Focus on the Family where it discusses only the health benefits of marriage. University of Chicago sociologist Linda Waite spent much of her career studying the effects of marriage on various demographics, leading to her book, The Case for Marriage. She observed, the evidence from four decades of research is surprisingly clear. A good marriage is both men's and women's best bet for living a long and healthy life. The health benefits are so significant, in fact, one sociologist described them as being as large as the benefit from giving up smoking. The current body of research consistently finds that married men and women are more likely to live longer, more likely to be physically healthier, more likely to be mentally healthier, more likely to be happier, recover from illness quicker and more successfully, and generally take better care of themselves and avoid risky behavior. Of course, there are many other positives for marriage, such as economic benefits, but what is interesting is that these benefits do not apply to cohabiting couples. Again, according to Rutgers University sociologist David Popino, cohabitation typically does not bring the benefits in physical health, wealth, and emotional well-being that marriage does. In terms of these benefits, cohabitants in the United States more closely resemble singles than married couples. This is due in part to the fact that cohabitants tend not to be as committed as married couples and they are more oriented toward their own personal autonomy and less to the well-being of their partner. Cohabiting is more about the self than the other person. And this is an interesting finding. Do you realize that the book, the Bible, which so many think restrains them from everything that is good, actually tells us that self-centered living is not as good as caring for someone else? Notice this short, straightforward statement attributed to Jesus Christ from Acts 20 and verse 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. But cohabitation and or sex outside of marriage is not only about adults, it's also about children. And we must ask whether this behavior is good for the children that so often come as a result. And again, the verdict is in. Numerous studies show that living together before marriage is not good for children. It is a well-known fact that a newborn child brings stress on a relationship and cohabiting couples, even those who profess they want to get married, don't handle this stress as well as couples who have committed to marry. According to Emily Yof, writing under the name of Prudence for Slate, an online U.S. magazine, for 10 years the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being study at Princeton University has followed the families of 5,000 children, three quarters born to unwed parents. According to the research, most of these parents, both men and women, said they wanted to get married and to each other, but they somehow feel this mutual decision is beyond their power to make, and by not making it, the forces of inertia start pulling them apart. Five years after their children's birth, only 16% of the couples had married, and 60% had split. And when a split occurs, this leaves children to be raised primarily or exclusively by one parent, most often the mother. While movies and television dramas often glorify single mothers, reality tells a very different story, and again, the verdict is in. Single parenting is not a good idea, in spite of the emotional protestations that one can get for simply stating this truth. Again from Emily Oaf. Studies have found that children born to single mothers are vastly more likely to be poor, have behavioral and psychological problems, drop out of high school, and themselves go on to have out of wedlock children. Ms. Yoaf describes the current single parent scene in America as a national catastrophe, but some may not be convinced by this evidence. It's true that one can find contradicting studies on these subjects, but the overwhelming weight of evidence is on the side of family life and living according to the moral code found in the Bible. 
To learn more about today's topic, visit www.twcanada.org to read or order your free copy of The Ten Commandments. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine. Call 1-866-784-7895. Call today. However, there is one piece of evidence that is neither subjective nor controversial. There's a very heavy price to pay for sexual immorality and the form of transmitted diseases and infections. These diseases are not limited to one nation, but are found in every part of the world where immorality abounds. Note this shocking Associated Press article regarding American teen girls. At least one in four teenage girls nationwide has a sexually transmitted disease, or more than three million teens according to the first study of its kind in this age group. Hardest hit by STDs is Africa, where HIV AIDS has taken a terrible toll. Most chilling of all, this disaster has appeared suddenly and while we were watching. In 1990, just 1% of adults in South Africa were HIV positive. Ten years later, the figure has risen to 25%. And the cause of HIV and AIDS? Immoral sexual behavior. It began in the homosexual community and has since spread to heterosexuals. It's also spread by dirty needles used by drug addicts and blood transfusions from infected people. Those who read the Bible should not be surprised by this. 1 Corinthians 6.18 gives a strong warning. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. The God who created us gave us His laws to protect us from hurting ourselves, but mankind refuses to believe Him in spite of the evidence. There are natural consequences that bring pain and suffering when we violate God's laws. As a loving parent, He instructs us on how to have a happy and harmonious life. Some behaviors may look good, but when we put them to the test, they fail miserably. As Proverbs 14, 12 tells us, there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So far, we've seen that sex prior to marriage doesn't work. But what about sexual immorality after marriage? Does it work any better? And the answer is clearly no. Many of the same curses apply here. Disease, divorce, and deep heartache resulting from betrayal. And of course, there are the children who are hurt by parental misbehavior. The foundation of biblical law is known as the Ten Commandments. And one of those commandments is, you shall not commit adultery. Adultery is a voluntary sexual act between a married person and someone who is not his or her spouse. And adultery is rampant in almost every corner of the earth. No significant country is immune from this sin and politicians and peasants are equally guilty. While most people applaud China's move to a market-oriented economy and the remarkable progress toward improving the physical living standards of hundreds of millions, a sad unintended consequence has accompanied this rise in living standards, and that's adultery. In March of 2000, a senior parliamentary official called for updating legislation to reflect social changes that resulted from two decades of market-oriented reforms. In his call for changes, he explained that the problem of adultery had risen with some people who had become more wealthy and powerful. We should not fail to see that there are some people who, when they become rich and powerful, become subjected to the obsolete and decadent ways of thinking of the feudalistic society in the past, he said. They have also become subjected to the invasion of the decadent way of thinking and living of the Western world. God wants us to be happy, but He allows us free moral agency, the ability to make our own decisions. 
In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, God calls upon us to make choices in life, and cumulatively, those choices take us in one of two opposite directions. We are told that we have free will to choose, but notice also that God encourages us to make the right choice. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. As we have seen with sex outside of marriage, there are a host of consequences that no one really wants. Have you heard the maxim, one definition of insanity is when someone keeps doing the same thing over again expecting different results? How long do we have to keep repeating the same moral mistakes before we wake up to realize that some things simply do not work? When will we open our eyes to see that the verdict is in? Here at Tomorrow's World, we're not so naive as to think that we have the ability of ourselves to change the behavior of even one person, much less the world. But we do believe that we can present the truth of the Bible along with truthful factual information and individuals can choose to respond positively. Now for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, the results of human behavior are obvious. Disobedience to God's laws bring pain and suffering. Obedience to His laws bring comfort to life. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the subject of today's program and the true God of the Bible and His laws and how they promote a harmonious society, be sure to check out our publication, The Ten Commandments, that will be shown on the screen momentarily. The verdict is in. These commandments will keep you from a world of pain and suffering. So be sure to go to our website right away to read or download our booklet, the Ten Commandments. And be sure to come back next week, same place, same time, to learn more about the God of creation and His coming kingdom in tomorrow's world. See you next week. To learn more about today's topic, visit www.twcanada.org to read or order your free copy of The Ten Commandments. It takes an in-depth look at the Ten Commandments and how they apply to your life. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing to us at Tomorrow's World, PO Box 409, Mississauga, Ontario, L5M 0P6. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine revealing God's principles for living an abundant and happy life while providing insight into current and future events. At our website, you can also watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-7895. Call, write, or visit us online today. This program is a production of The Living Church of God.